People who are new to the world of firearms have a lot of worries. Perhaps one of the biggest is handling a gun's recoil. I remember my first time shooting a handgun. It was an officer-sized 1911 loaded with Winchester white box 230 grains. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I can faintly remember how intimidating and stressful it was when I squeezed the trigger for the first time. It took a while before I managed to empty the six-round magazine. All the time, I was gripping the handgun really tight because the range officer told me to. I was determined to hold on to the damn thing as I didn't want to drop it while shooting. I feared that if I dropped it, it might go off and someone might get hit. A little over three decades later, I can now shoot a Taurus Raging Bull with an 8.37-inch barrel chambered in a 454 castle all day without getting sore. I've shot a lot of different handgun models chambered in the most popular civilian cartridges on the market that I've lost count. I've gotten to the point where the fear associated with controlling a gun's recoil has almost become non-existent. Almost. Let me say that again. Almost. Why is that? Because no matter how accustomed I've become to recoil, there are still handguns chambered for specific calibers that I stay away from. These are the kinds that hurt you really bad no matter how thick your wrists have grown, no matter how big your arms have become, no matter what shooting stance you use. Here's my top five most painful handguns to shoot. Bond Arms Mini and 45 Long Colt. First on my list is the Bond Arms Mini chambered in 45 Long Colt. Some of you may have made the presumption from the start of this video that my list will include Derringers. If you did, then you know your Derringer, so hats off to you. You probably already shot one chambered in some big bore revolver cartridge, and it was so painful to shoot that you had to ask yourself, why'd you even bother in the first place? I know because that's what I did after shooting the Bond Arms Mini, which is why I included this bad boy on my list. Weighing in at only 19 ounces, the Bond Arms Mini is surprisingly heavy for its size. Like the other two Derringers we'll talk about later, it sports two barrels in an over and under configuration, each one measuring two and a half inches. Each one also chambers a 45 Long Colt cartridge, which means you only get two shots, so whatever you do, if you ever have to pull the trigger, you have to make sure those two shots will count. Also, like the other Derringers on this list, the Bond Arms Mini is extremely easy to carry concealed because it's really tiny. And being really tiny doesn't always mean having a painful recoil as Derringers chambered in rimfire cartridges such as the 22 Long Rifle or even the 22 Magnum are typically gentle on the hand. But the 45 Long Colt is no rimfire and already has a stout recoil when shot from a large frame revolver. From the Bond Arms Mini shooting factory, 45 Long Colt loads can be somewhat intolerable and don't even get me started about warmer 45 Long Colt loads on the market. If you're new to firearms and you've never tried shooting a Bond Arms Mini and 45 Long Colt before, take my advice. Stay away from it. Smith & Wesson Model 340 PD and 357 Magnum. The second handgun on my list is the Smith & Wesson Model 340 PD. Smith & Wesson touts this model as the lightest small frame revolver chambered for the 357 Magnum, and it's 100% true. You'd be hard-pressed to find a smaller and lighter offering from any of the company's revolver manufacturing competitors like Colt, Ruger, or Taurus. As with its bigger brother, which we'll talk about later, the Model 340 PD uses the same materials, aluminum scandium alloy for its frame and titanium alloy for its cylinder, the fact that a revolver this small and lightweight can chamber factory 357 Magnum loads is a testament to the strength of the alloy Smith & Wesson's engineers decided to use. The 357 Magnum may not be as punishing as its bigger Magnum brethren when it comes to recoil, but the Model 340 PD is a tiny little J-frame that weighs only about 11.8 ounces. If you just take a quick glance at it, you might assume that there's no way it can handle the 357 Magnum but you'd be wrong. As far as dimensions and strength, the Model 340 PD is truly in a league of its own. No other revolver in its weight class comes close. But as Rocky Balboa said in one of his later movies, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. No matter how handy and durable the Model 340 PD is, its lightweight makes it one of the most painful handguns to shoot. If I'm being honest, I don't understand the need for this handgun. Like, what the hell was Smith & Wesson thinking? 
Sure, lightweight models are easier to conceal, and carrying them all day doesn't result in soreness or muscle cramps, but why bother making a revolver this light to chamber it for 357 Magnum when it could have been chambered for 38 Special Plus P, which can get the job done too, but without the pain? Even better, why not just get a Glock 33? It's just a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier, but it's thinner as it's a semi-automatic. It doesn't have that bulging cylinder, which makes it infinitely easier to conceal. Factory Glock 33 magazines can accommodate nine rounds of 357 SIG, which offers significantly higher combined foot pounds of force than the five rounds of 357 Magnum in the Smith & Wesson Model 340 PD. There are aftermarket Glock 33 magazines that can accept up to 14 rounds of 357 SIG if the factory magazines won't cut it. And best of all, the Glock 33 doesn't kick anywhere near as bad as the Model 340 PD. Bond Arms Roughneck in 357 Magnum. Third on my list is the Bond Arms Roughneck chambered in 357 Magnum. Except for its fancy name and the cartridge it's chambered for, the Bond Arms Roughneck isn't really any different from the Bond Arms Mini in 45 Long Colt I talked about earlier. It has two barrels in an over and under configuration, each measuring two and a half inches, and it also weighs in at just 19 ounces. So how's it different, you ask? Factory 357 Magnum loads are typically more powerful than factory 45 long Colt loads. This is because the two cartridges were not designed the same way. The 357 Magnum's case wall is thicker and beefier and is rated for SAMI pressures reaching up to 35,000 PSI, while the 45 long Colt's case is thinner and has a SAMI rating of less than half of the 357 Magnum's, only around 14,000 PSI. There are a few boutique custom ammo manufacturers such as Buffalo Bore that do come up with super hot overpressure 45 long Colt loads approaching 44 Magnum levels of ballistic performance, but these loads aren't very common and can only be fired safely from a handful of robustly built revolvers such as the Ruger Blackhawk or the Magnum Research BFR. What this means is the chances of you getting your hand beaten to a pulp by a Derringer chambered for the 45 Long Colt is fairly slim. The opposite's true for a Derringer chambered in 357 Magnum. If you think shooting 357 Magnum rounds out of the Smith & Wesson Model 340 PD is painful, think again. The Model 340 PD has a fuller pistol grip, while the Bond Arms Roughneck has a tiny little stub for a grip. Whenever the Bond Arms is shot, the force of the recoil isn't evenly distributed across the palm of the shooter's hand, which makes shooting it much more difficult. Smith & Wesson Model 329 PD in 44 Magnum The fourth on my list is the Smith & Wesson Model 329 PD. It's available in three different chamberings, 45 ACP, 357 Magnum, and 44 Magnum. It's also offered in different barrel lengths. For the purposes of this video, we'll only concern ourselves with the Model 329 PD chambered for the 44 Magnum. Weighing in at 25.2 ounces, the Smith & Wesson Model 329 PD revolver uses aluminum scandium alloy for its frame and titanium alloy for its cylinder. Just considering how expensive scandium and titanium can be, you can tell that Smith & Wesson went balls to the wall with this model, it was designed specifically to be the lightest weight revolver built on their large double action frame called the end frame. It's light but has enough strength to handle the type of abuse full power 44 Magnum rounds are known for. Was it successful as far as its purpose? Yes and no. The Smith & Wesson Model 329 PD is without a doubt the easiest to carry large frame revolver, its only real claim to fame being its light weight. It makes it easy to lug the revolver around all day in a backpack without getting sore, but because it's lightweight, it makes shooting full house 44 Magnum rounds close to unbearable, and that's putting it mildly. If you intend to shoot it a lot, you'll either have to settle for warmer 44 special loads, hand load your own light 44 Magnum loads, or prepare your wrist for a beating that you'll never develop a tolerance for. If you want a workhorse of a revolver chambered for the 44 Magnum, we recommend you opt for any of the all-steel models on the market today. The Colt Anaconda 2021, the Smith & Weston Model 629, the Ruger Super Red Hawk, the Ruger Red Hawk, or even the Taurus Raging Bull are all better choices. 
Now, if you want to pack a lightweight handgun that's still a thumper in many respects, the minimum I would recommend is the Glock 40 loaded with 15 rounds of the hottest 10mm rounds you can get your hands on. Otherwise, get a Glock 41 and convert it to a 460 Roland. Some of you may ask, what the hell is a 460 Roland? If you've never heard of it, most 45 ACP handguns these days can be converted to shoot the 460 Roland, a rimless semi-auto cartridge that's just a tad bit longer than the 45 ACP, is more powerful than the 45 Super, and has ballistics approaching entry-level 44 Magnum loads. A Glock 41 loaded with 13 of those 460 Rolands in the magazine is the bee's knees. Now that's real power in a lightweight package without the painful recoil. American Derringer Model M4 Alaskan Survival in 4570 Government. And finally, we come to our last handgun on the list, the American Derringer Model M4 Alaskan Survival chambered in 4570 Government. This particular model isn't being produced anymore, and it's anybody's guess why, which means if you somehow find yourself itching to purchase one, assuming you have masochistic tendencies, you probably won't see too many listings online as this Derringer is now considered a collectible firearm. Similar to the other Derringers I talked about earlier, the Model M4 Alaskan Survival has two barrels in an over and under configuration, but the similarity stopped there as each barrel is chambered for a different cartridge. The top barrel is chambered in the 4570 government, while the bottom barrel is chambered for a 410 shot shell. The 410 shot shell isn't something to write home about, but the 4570 government is something else. On the slim chance that you didn't know, the 4570 government is a big bore rifle cartridge that, with the right bullet weight, powder weight, and powder type, will easily eclipse the 44 Magnum in terms of velocity and energy. Underwood's 4570 government Extreme Hunter, for instance, has a fluted 225 grain solid copper bullet with a velocity of around 1730 feet per second out of a 3 inch revolver barrel and is capable of generating around 1496 foot pounds of force. This particular load will blow the hottest 44 Magnum load out of the water, that's for sure. Going back to the American Derringer Model M4 Alaskan Survival, as far as weight, it's the lightest Derringer on my list, weighing in at only 16.5 ounces. Combine this with the fact that it chambers the most powerful cartridge any Derringer's ever been chambered for, and it won't be difficult to understand why I declare this Model M4 Alaskan Survival the most painful handgun anyone can shoot, bar none. And as with all the other models on this list, I failed to understand why this was even created. Then again, production was discontinued years ago, so no surprise there. And that's it for my list of the five most painful handguns to shoot. If you know of any other handgun models out there that are even more painful to shoot, feel free to share it with us by commenting down below. If you find this video helpful or entertaining, like, share, and subscribe, and click on that bell icon so you won't miss out on future videos. And as always, thanks for watching.